Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending today's talk. Uh, I am Song Jin Jung, a moderator of today's talk. I'm a professor of economics at Gyeongsang National University and chief of research of Social Science Korea Research in Post Capitalism and the Innovation of Marxism, hosting this online talk program. Today's talk is the last one of the series of this talk program since last March. I'm very pleased to invite Professor Marcelo Musto, my dearest friend, as well as worldly distinguished uh, scholar on Marxism, as a speaker for finalizing this program. Although I guess that most of you know about Marcelo very well, uh, please allow me to introduce Marcelo shortly. Marcelo Busto is currently a full professor at the Depart uh, Department of Sociology at York University, Canada. Marcelo is also an editor of numerous books, including Another Marx, uh, published in 2018, The Last Years of Karl Marx, published in 2020, and The Marx Revival, uh, published in 2020, and Karl Marx, Writings on Alienation uh, is a uh, forthcoming book. And his writings have been published worldwide in more than 20 languages. Among them, we Korean have two. Uh, two uh, books as of now is uh, Rethinking Marx and Marxism and the Last Struggles of Marx. Uh, last February, uh, Marcelo gave was an excellent online talk on Marx's concept of alienation. And uh, for this evening, uh, Marcelo will talk on rethinking alternatives with Marx. For today's talk, Marcelo will speak about 45 minutes. Marcelo, welcome and please start. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, it is a pleasure to be back here. And um, it is not a case that I want to introduce the talk with this um, uh, very um, different kind of salutation because we are literally everywhere around the world. And uh, uh, Professor Young and I, or Seon Jing, as I will call him from now on, decided to give to this final talk a sort of, um, you know, not focusing on a specific topic, but um, um, hopefully having um, a collective um, conversation about um, Marx and some of the issues that we discussed in this very long marathon that lasts for uh, 22 lectures. Um, before starting, I cannot uh, avoid, um, um, you know, uh, thanking uh, Seon Jing Yong and all the team of uh, Gyeongsang National University for all they have done for us because, you know, they have uh, reorganized their um, such project due to the pandemic, and um, they have been able to um, divide um, um, these uh, sessions in two rounds and uh, cover many topics, invite many scholars. And I would say that uh, some of the lectures that um, are also available on YouTube and will last for um, a long time on YouTube, uh, are good from two points of view. That is the kind of things that I like better. They are very interesting for scholars, specialists in the Marx studies, because every lecture you hear, you will read something new about Marx, about Marxism, etc. But at the same time, I found that they are excellent also to introduce Marx and Marxism to a new generation of students. And I see many um, also young students and uh, among the participants or people wrote me emails, I've seen this lecture, I've seen this thing. So many, many thanks to, of course, Professor Young, but um, um, we must mention uh, Jin Wugo who has been so kind with all of us for all these months, dealing with all this strange professor being you know, so difficult. And also with Minzi who has been a perfect assistant with them other administrative things. So my hope, and if I may, the hope of other scholars that have been hosted by you in this, uh, in this month is to have um, a wonderful volume that will collect some of this talk, some of this lecture, so that in the future, 
um, many readers across the world can, can um, read what we have been discussing. Um, so I would like to, in this eclectic uh, presentation today, I would like to start by um, showing some of the uh, work that I've been doing in the past uh, uh, couple of years. And um, I will um, uh, project a few um, uh, covers. This is, as uh, Seon Jing said, the, the uh, publication that we discussed a few months ago when we had the, the talk on alienation. So there is not very much that I have to say about this. And from now on, this is not an advertisement, but actually, you know, to show you how uh, alive are Marx and Marxist studies today. So all these um, um, books that I will be showing you now are actually collective works that um, like Seon Jing or many times with Seon Jing, like this series of talk I've been doing in the past years. This one was a, um, a book on the 150th anniversary on capital. This one is a conference that we have co-organized. I've already seen my dear colleague Peter Hoodis, he was one of the protagonists of the conference in uh, Patna in India, and um, uh, I am having um, problems with, with the PowerPoint, sorry, let's see if you, can you see it now? Seon Jin, can you see it, or do I have to share it again? I cannot see, I cannot see the PowerPoint. I will try oh, yes. again. Oh, yes, I can see. I will use from, from here. And um, this is the Mark Survival. That is another book that came out um, a few months ago, uh, less than a year ago. Many of the speakers that uh, were invited by Seon Jing in this uh, series of lectures, um, I already mentioned Peter Rudis, but you know, I don't know, Kevin Anderson, several others are in this, uh, in this volume. And um, in this volume, the idea was to present to the readers what Marx actually wrote about uh, 22 key concepts and, um, you know, trying to see um, what um, must be updated, the mistakes of Marx, uh, the problems, the contradiction, but also some of the ideas that are uh, very relevant, still relevant for us today. And this is the last volume that is coming out in a, in a, in a few months. And the, the title of this volume is the title of the talk today. Um, it is uh, the, uh, you know, it started from another big international conference that organized, co-organized in Pisa. I've seen that there is also Enrico Campo online, one of the protagonists of that uh, big event. And um, we wanted to focus on these topics, ecology, migration, and I will end actually my presentation on this because these are topics that, are, um, that have been associated with Marx um, only a few times, but actually the new readings of Marx are helping us to discover an author that was not merely focused on uh, the contradiction between uh, capital and labor, et cetera, et cetera. And this is another volume that uh, it is um, very uh, useful for my talk today. This is a forthcoming volume. Uh, Seon Jing Yong has been one of the authors. This is a book with the 75 authors, 400,000 words. I think in the end will be 850 pages. It is the, um, hopefully um, perhaps the most complete history about the rece reception, dissemination of Marx ideas in the world, because we have a chapter for each country and language. This book is uh, being edited by Baba Kamini and I uh, about all the countries and languages where capital was translated in full. So it is really a global uh, research on Marx and, uh, and Marxism. And I want to say to the young scholars that are listening now, that um, if I look at myself back 20 years ago, when I started, when I was a PhD student, I remember how difficult it was to publish a book on Marx. I remember looking at catalogs, even in um, countries like Italy, France, I'm not talking only about the English, um, um, uh, speaking word, so countries with uh, a very strong tradition into Marxist studies. I remember looking at uh, catalogs, publication, and you will find two, three books on Marx per year. 
the things have changed very much. And we can say that Marx studies, Marxist studies is a very alive field today. And uh, the series that I um, uh, added, uh, Pagram Macmillan, Marx, Engels, Marxism in a, is an example of this in a few years. We have been publishing more than 50 volumes and we have 70 volumes under contract in the pipeline and many other proposal. Um, and there is also a new series that I just um, opened with Routledge that is called Critiques and Alternative to Capitalism, because I don't think that the point is only to um, go back to Marx and only look at the past, but to look at this um, varieties of socialism and uh, to make justice of other authors like we are trying to make justice of Marx. This would be the second part of my talk, thanks to the Marx Engels que sometimes gather. And sometimes making justice to these other authors means also going against Marx, right? Against some misinterpretation that he gave of socialists who were contemporaries to him, or you know the early socialists that they've been called like utopian from the traditions, Marxist tradition in the 20th century. I will end with this book, 2020, because I will focus. Um, my presentation on the final, the second part of my presentation on, on uh, um, the last years of Karl Marx. So uh, having said this, um, I would like to discuss a little bit with you what is um, the state, continue a little bit the discussion with you about what is the state of Marxist studies in the world today? Um, because as I was trying to say before, there is a um, um, a remarkable revival that is um, a revival that, uh, from my point of view, and I will insist about this, is not only a revival in terms of um, academic studies in several disciplines, um, but there is also a demand for politics. And this is uh, without you know, exaggerating about this, without making too much uh, propaganda and ideology about this, but in times of crisis, and we live dramatic time of crisis, times of crisis from many point of view, there is this um, idea of going back to, to the giants of the past and Karl Marx is surely one of them. And um, beside this, um, revival of publication that I've been trying to uh, you know, present um, very quickly. Um, and of course, more focus on the work that I've been doing, but this is just a, a very little and model, modest part of uh, the, um, the scenario today. I want to say that uh, in, uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, there is um, um, a strong attention for Marx in, in Latin America. And there are some countries, uh, one example is, for, is uh, Brazil, where um, you have uh, um, a new generation of scholars, a new generation of readers of Marx, but I'm talking about, um, you know, um, new publications of, of Marx, new translation reprints that are usually um, read by thousands of people that I sold in several thousands of copies. That uh, is um, a significant uh, turning point in, uh, in this um, uh, global um, scenario for, for Marxist studies. And the same, I was mentioning this a couple of minutes ago, in Europe. Not everywhere, because um, you know, in all the countries where there was the so-called actually existing socialism, talking about Marx and Marxism is uh, still um, in uh, dramatically difficult, I would say, like in East European countries and even in Russia. We don't have this um, uh, phenomenon of a strong return of uh, publication, conferences, etc. But even, even there, compared to 15, 20 years ago, in, in countries like, um, uh, you know, the ex-Yugoslavia and Hungary, so even uh, Poland, very conservative countries, right? Countries that, um, you know, today uh, express some of the most conservative government um, in the world. There is uh, um, attention for Marx. There is publication of new um, writings of Marx and uh, a debate that is starting again. In Asia, 
um, you know, the situation is more complex, but uh, perhaps we can talk about this later. Surely there are new translations of Marx in China. So there is a, a very systematic new edition translated from the German, from the Mega 2. And the Korea is one of the, South Korea, you know, is one of the examples where there is a, a, a very alive publication of studies on Marx. Those of us who visit South Korea often know this, even though this is just for a, for a small circle of, um, of scholars and, you know, very difficult to speak to, to, to new generations. So the, the second question that I would like to bring to our conversation today is what kind of Marx we read today? And this is also uh, something that has been the uh, subject of um, uh, research that I've done in the past years. And unfortunately, the readings of Marx um, in the academia is most of the countries, not all of them, because there are very uh, positive uh, examples of uh, renewals of reading of Marx, and I will try to mention later. But unfortunately, um, we still read uh, in uh, uh, universities some texts of Marx that are um, dated and perhaps that are not as interesting as other could be. For example, if you look at the majority of the faculties of the Department of Philosophy, the most read text of Marx is, uh, are still the 1844 manuscript, the Economical Philosophical Manuscript that are, and we discussed this in my uh, talk here when we were talking about, debating about alienation, that are unfortunately represented, often represented as the most important Marx, the best Marx, the most relevant Marx. And this is um, a significant problem that, uh, that we have to address. When we look at the Department of Sociologists, unfortunately, I see that uh, the most used uh, uh, um, um, sometimes, you know, um, excerpts of, of Marx that are included in textbook or are assigned to students are the um, pages of the German ideology about the division of labor that we know very well that are um, um, old, dated, and written by a very uh, young scholars who is just at the beginning of his but into, into political economy. And if we go in the department of politics, um, there is a lot of, uh, uh, on the Jewish question, in many countries, there is not even a translation of the text of Bruno Bauer, the Jewish question, to which Marx is responding. So there are many misunderstanding, misrepresentation about this. Or, of course, the Communist Manifesto, but the Communist Manifesto is not read, as Marx and Engels said at the end of their life, as an historical document. I, be I believe that there are many more uh, useful and interesting um, uh, manifesto, even though they are not as brilliant and wonderful like the, the text of 1848. But uh, um, if we look, for example, at the, some documents that Marx wrote at the end of his life for the French Socialist Party, you will find many uh, interesting things. And surely you don't go in some of the issues that Marx wrote in the manifesto and then surpass later in his life. To make just one example, and then I will end this, of this um, political polemics, you know, sometimes there is a debate about Marx and Proudhon, who was uh, perhaps the most important socialist in France at his time, together with, uh, with, um, with Blanqui. But usually we read this polemic with these two texts of 1846, 1847, uh, Misère de la Philosophie, Philosophie de la Misère, and we actually don't look at the real um, field of the battle between communist uh, and um, mutualist, between the followers of Marx, who were a minority, and the followers of Proudhon, uh, the mutualist, that is, you know, the history of the international between 1864 and 1872. So um, I would say that uh, after 2008, there has been a lot of interest for capital, and this is something that uh, should make all of us extremely happy. In this series of talks, we have heard some of the most uh, um, um, brilliant interpreters of Marx um, today in the world. And I was fascinated by some of the discussion, the attention that we paid, and therefore we help students to, to read Marx very carefully. Which version of Capital should we read? 
the French translation, the second German edition. So this is something very important. And uh, of course, as I said in the other talk, I don't want to repeat myself, I am very happy that the focus is brought to these writings of Marx instead of the very beautiful, brilliant early writings. But we have to be careful about this meat of the young Marx. We can discuss about this if there are questions later. But I want to say that um, the center of my work on Marx in the last uh, couple of years, in the last three, four years, has been an attempt to revitalize the political writings of Marx. I don't want to put in contradiction capital with uh, you know, the politics, not at all. But um, I believe that in order to change this trend that I mentioned so far, what Marx is read, why, et cetera, we have a responsibility to produce new volumes, new volumes, new books for a uh, for wide audience. And we cannot expect that a new generation of um, activists of scholars are reading uh, Marx in German, all of them, or are buying and reading the 50 volumes of the Marx Engels collected works, etc. So there are efforts in this direction. For example, um, David Norman Smith is, uh, I believe, very soon pu finally publishing a wonderful volume for Yale University Press about the writings of the last Marx, of the last years of, uh, of Marx. Um, I tried to edit this anthology on alienation by giving a lot of relevance to Capital and its preparatory manuscript or the polemic in, um, and the political debate within the first international. I think it was very useful to read not only Marx, but read Marx with all the other texts and not only by uh, socialist intellectuals, but also by workers themselves and how they played a very relevant role in moving forward the politics of the international. Um, of course, we cannot ignore, and we should be very grateful to um, the uh, editors of the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, because we can do a balance now after, I would say almost 25 years, the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe restarted in 1998. I'm gonna show you soon a table, a chart that I prepared for you. And there are about 25 new volumes that have been published so far. And these volumes are very useful for us because they help us to understand Marx much, much better. And in some cases, I will say this is something that has changed my research. They also help me to understand the 19th century better. Because, for example, when we read the letters of Marx and Engels, this is the third section of the mega, we no longer read, like in the past, only Marx writing to Engels, Engels writing to Marx, but now we have access to thousands and thousands, more than 12,000 of letters written by other activists, other scholars who were in touch with Marx and Engels, who inspired them, who gave them idea, so we can go much more in depth. In the mega, of course, we have from 2013, all the preparatory version of Capital available from the Grundrisse 1857 up to the final publications of um, Engels of uh, volumes two and three, the one that he published in 1885 and 1894. And we also have new version of the manuscript of 1844, the German ideology that has been a very big topic of debate in the in the last uh, few years. We can talk about this. We actually have a different edition of the German ideology in the series Marx Engels Marxism edited by Terrell Carver. And we also have this uh, wonderful uh, notebooks, um, actually more than 30 volumes of notebooks of excerpt that Marx is taking in his life from the university years up to the very last months, as I write in my book, until the beginning of 1883. So in order to do this, I want to introduce a new topic that uh, I hope I can discuss with you later during the, the debate. That is the very relevant uh, connection between Marx's life, when I say life, of course, I mean his intellectual biography, but also all the vicissitudes of his life and the writings, how the intellectual biography is very important to understand the weight that we have to give to certain writings and less to other writings. 
In order to do this, I usually divide Marx's writings into five different um, uh, categories. The first one are the books, the writings, the texts that he published himself. And of course, they should have a stronger weight compared to, to um, many other manuscripts. But even there, we have to be careful because as I said a few minutes ago, the Communist Manifesto should be considered like an historical document and not like the political text in which we can um, read and discover the solution that Marx and Engels, by the way, very young at the time, um, wanted to give to um, class struggle European politics. Then there is a very broad category that I usually call, you know, the manuscripts. And um, these manuscript, preparatory manuscripts, um, are some of them are advanced draft of books, of texts that Marx wanted to publish. And for different reasons, he did not publish. But some of them are also books that Marx wrote, texts that Marx wrote for um, self-verstandigung for self-clarification. And um, one of them is the, the, the Grundriss, right? The manuscript that he wrote um, uh, so brilliantly uh, in about six months after the um, um, eruption, the beginning of the economic crisis in, uh, in the United States in 1857. Um, the third category are the, uh, are, is journalism. So the articles that it Marx um, wrote, but we have to be very careful and that's why reading Marx um, letters, being aware of his biography useful because some of them are articles that Marx just wrote because he needed $2 at the end of the week to buy potatoes and to feed his family, that's it. And like many brilliant journalists uh, wrote, you know, a journal article is something that should be nice, inspiring, but at 12 uh, uh, a.m., so just before lunch, is good because you have to put uh, the fish or when you peel the, 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 the fruit, you know, you need the, the, the paper and uh, that's how you use it. So some of these publications are just good for that, but some of the things were useful for Marx because they push him toward the directions or topics the two topics that are um, um, of uh, the economic crisis. Marx has been a journalist for almost 20 years in his life. I, I know that many people believe that uh, reading this biography that Marx was sitting on his couch uh, and smoking a cigar and drinking the Porto that Engels was sending to Manchester, but actually Ma Marx has done, besides writing Capital, a very significant um, uh, uh, journalistic activity. We also know that at least one third of the articles that he signed for the New York Tribune, the most important newspaper, the most read newspaper in the United States, Marx wrote for more than a decade, 1851, 1862, were written by Engels. And from that point of view, there is a real division of labor because Engels is writing about military issues, Engels the general, while Marx is writing about other things. Actually, a division of labor that I will not find in many other phases of their life or with relation to many other topics, like for example, editing capital and all the troubles that uh, Marx gave to the poor Engels that we usually criticize, but we uh, will talk later about what Marx left to Engels. So I already mentioned the fourth category, the correspondence, the letters, and how wonderful are today because they are uh, very useful to go in depth um, European history and not only. And then the fifth and final category that are the notebooks. Um, so I want to um, um, now share once again my screen with you. And uh, I have uh, prepared um, a chart that um, uh, I called different marks, different Marxism. I don't want to bother you and my time is uh, running out very quickly. So this is a document that has been shared by 
uh, by Jingwu and by Xiu Jing, and uh, you can um, read this later. Hopefully, it's useful. You know, I make a distinction between square brackets. You find the titles that Marx has not uh, published, and uh, without the titles that uh, that he published. I want to call, and you know, on the right side of this chart, you will find information about the edition, and on the left side, the year of writings. I would like to call your attention on this uh, uh, part here um, because I wanted to make um, a division, not an, an artificial division. I mean, it's something that we can discuss uh, later if you, if you want, between the writings that Marx published by himself and uh, those who were published uh, uh, um, after his, uh, his death. So I am... Uh, underlying here the manifesto of the Communist Party. There is a text that Marx published, you know, at the perfect uh, momentum, but that nobody read <laughs> before the revolution. You know, the Communist Manifesto started to be disseminated and translated uh, at the end of the 60s, but in particular, and of course, for political reasons, only after the Paris Commune in 1879. That is the time when Marx became the red terror doctor because you know if we go back to Marx's life you know uh, he was a, a very isolated individual in the 1850s when he was alone in London I would say that he was in touch with the six seven comrades six seven people you know less than than uh, ten and um, only with the international 1864 and then of course with the Paris Commune that brought you know the revolutionary politics at the center of the political debate in Europe. Marx is um, um, you know playing a significant role, and that's why I underline the civil war in France. That is the text that Marx wrote for the Paris Commune. We celebrated the anniversary of the Commune a few months ago, and then the other significant text, Capital, Volume One. But if you look at the other texts that uh, that he wrote. I'm not saying that the 18 Brumaire is not a fantastic book, right? I'm just saying that um, there were um, uh, very, there was a very limited reception of this um, text when Marx wrote them. Because, you know, um, for example, these early writings, The Holy Family, Poverty of Philosophy, they are unknown, I would say, to the generation of young uh, students today. And actually, we read the text that Marx did not publish, like the 1844 manuscript and the German ideology. And sometimes we read them in a very bad way. Or, you know, the books that Marx published, the, the contribution to the critique of political economy, it is a text that was received only one review by Engels. And by the way, Marx wanted to have a very different review or this very complicated book, Herr Vogt, that is a thick book, a polemic with Karl Vogt, who was a, a former member of the Democratic Parliament of 1848, who said many injuries about Marx and Marx had to respond. In any case, these are books that had a very uh, limited reception. In the second part of, the, of this uh, chart that I uh, prepared, uh, I wanted to show you the unfinished manuscripts that were published by, by you know, other people after Marx. Often Engels, but not only because, you know, uh, I don't know, the tears of post value were published by Ikowski between 1905 and 1910. And then actually they were also published in a bad way. So they had other um, editions after that. So between square brackets, you will find the year of publication uh, of this uh, uh, Texas um, and here the, the time, the year when they were written. But as we discussed um, um, during my first talk, like the year of publication sometimes doesn't say very much because the economic manuscript of 1844 started to circulate, you know, I will say from the beginning of the 50s, from the end of the 40s, right? So after this decade of Nazism, Hitler, World War II, et cetera. And the Grundrisse also, you know, they were published in 1939, but, uh, you know, the English translation is something that came out only in 1973, just to mention one uh, example. And there are also political issues, for example, the critique of the Gotha program that, uh, 
you know, um, if you want, we can discuss later, but, you know, sometimes there is also the right time to publish um, and to make public some documents that were internal um, um, tools of a political struggle, because going back to the distinction that I made before of Marx writing in five categories, the correspondence of Marx, the letters, is a tool of um, revolutionary politics. Marx, and even more than Marx, Engels used to write to many, many people. Engels used to write letters and read letters in 12 languages, and they were essential because they didn't have uh, Twitter, Facebook, internet internet, et cetera, to, you know, um, uh, inform um, and also to contribute to the, the, the political uh, education of activists, of militants, um, not only in Europe, but, uh, you know, also uh, in the United States. And, uh, you know, at the end of this, there are also some uh, uh, notebooks that uh, we use today, the notes of Kowalewski, the notes of Morgan, ancient society, that uh, really came out 100 years after their publication. So again, I don't want to bother you with too many information. In this chart here, there are the uh, manuscripts that Marx wrote before the beginning of writing the first draft of Capital or the first draft of his critique of political economy, that is the Grundrisse. This is also debatable, but I want to enter in very sophisticated um, debates. Here, there are information about the editions, the main editions of Marx and Engels, and also the, this very relevant period, 1883, 1895, the birth of Marxism, Engels had a very significant role in these years, not only republishing new editions, translation with new introduction, et cetera, of texts that uh, were known before. The Communist Manifesto is one example, and editing uh, the two volumes of Capital or publishing the thesis on Feuerbach, the critique of the Goda program, but also publishing himself, um, you know, books that sometimes had uh, a wider circulation than Marx himself, like, for example, the socialism, utopian and scientific, that, you know, perhaps is um, a text that, like a uh, few others, contributed to some um, misunderstanding uh, uh, of, um, you know, the debate uh, uh, among socialism in their generation. And in this final uh, uh, chart that I wanted to share with you, uh, I just want to show you uh, in uh, different ages in different decades, what Marx was available to readers or to activists. And I just put together some, you know, some names, for example, Willem Liebknecht, that was one of the main leader of the SPD of the German Social Democratic Party. So, you know, he had the Communist Manifesto, he knew these documents about uh, the international, and uh, he also had capital, but, you know, like many other people, you know, he had read perhaps only few parts of Capital. If we look 50 years after and we go into the um, library of, uh, of Lenin, we see that there are many more materials because now Lenin can read the second and the third volume of Capitals edited by Engels, the theory of surplus values provided by Kowski. These internal documents like the critique of the Gotha program that is a, a very key text for Lenin, right? is uh, available and is also, you know, reading the introduction of 1857. So you see that there is a new Marx after 50 years. That's why I call this chart different Marx, different questions and also different Marxism. The generation of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Louis Althusser, and I have chosen the two people at the opposite side of the barricades, but, you know, they're focusing their analysis on this young Marx, the so-called young Marx. So everything is written in the early 40s when Marx um, was extremely young, between 1843 and 1845, 46, the German ideology. And everybody's using this text to say, this is the best Marx, this Marx is not Marxist, et cetera, et cetera. I've chosen the name of Negri here because it's perhaps one of the most relevant interpreter of, um, I mean, successful, then I don't want to open debates, etc. but about the Grundrisse, right? The, the tradition in the country where I was born, um, you know, workerism, uh, etc. So this Grundrisse were actually available 
to the uh, ample, uh, uh, a wide audience of readers between the end of the 60s and uh, the middle of, of the 70s. Now there are also the articles of the New York Tribune that are actually, you know, editors, scholars understood their relevance and they put together anthologies from these articles, selecting those who were good from those who were written to buy the potatoes and pay the debt with, uh, with, uh, with the bakery. And there are also these documents about the late Marx that uh, came out in the 70s. And then very, very slowly, I would say that we had the wonderful talks of Kevin Anderson, um, Tairako Tomonaga, people who uh, spend a lot of time in the last uh, years working on, on this uh, uh, late Marx. And then today, you know, mega, after the mega 2021, as I mentioned before, we have many notebooks, we have a new edition, we can read Marx more carefully, um, the young Marx, and we have finally all the preparatory manuscripts and drafts of Capital. So I want to say, and I wanna, I'm gonna close this so that I can return uh, live, I want to say that uh, it is not true that everything about Marx has been already written. And this is the message that I want to give to the young um, scholars, students who are listening to the talk now. Because I remember being you know, very young PhD students entering in this big um, libraries and there were walls and walls of books full of uh, you know, um, uh, <laughs> interpretations of Marx, introduction to Marx, etc. And then you say, how is it possible to write about this, to write something else, something new, something interesting? It is not true. And I would say, going back to the question of the mega, that Marx is the author, is the classic whose profile has changed more in the last decades in the last two decades. You know, we are scholars of Marx. So everybody who is a scholar of somebody say, oh, this is the more beautiful, this is the longest beard, this has changed most, etc." But if we compare the uh, work that has been done on the editions of Marx and Engels, and we look at this many new documents, some of them preparatories, you know, that are uh, of course, confined to a, um, a pool of uh, um, specialists, but we can really see that it is possible today to read Marx much um, uh, better than, uh, than before. And of course, this task uh, implies that there is a generation of editors that translate this uh, many big volumes of thousands and thousands of pages of notes into readable uh, anthologies or um, you know, new editions, and then a generation of scholars who study these things and um, work on that. Um, it is already 2.48, and I said that I will spend the second part of my talk on the last Marx, so unfortunately I'm very late, but I will try to complex because there is something that I must say, um, because in the last years, like Anderson, like uh, um, Tairako Tomonaga, like uh, Peter Rudis, if I may, even though Peter has been doing so many works uh, on also not only on Marx, on Rosa Luxemburg, many other things, but I have this very strong interest for this political writings of Marx, and I take a lot of this from the years of the international, from this decade of the international, but also to the last years of Marx, that I would say, it is a very important moment in his life, considering all the failures of Marx in his life. And the first one is the fact that he was not able, not only to you know, rewrite and finish the second volume of Capital, but you know, not even to finalize this uh, version of, of volume one. So there is a question about, the energies of Marx and, you know, in connection with this, the, the change of um, intellectual project that he had in this period, because he really wanted to have a, a more ample scenario than the one that he had for Capital uh, Volume 1. That's why he was studying so much United States and uh, Russia and was receiving this statistic and started to read Russia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is not the topic of my on my talk, and I want to add more to the debate on capital that has been already very intense in the previous lectures. I want to say that um, 
this uh, late Marx, if we want to call it in this way, is often a forgotten chapter in Marx's intellectual biography, in the anthologies of Marx, in the publication of Marx. And this is something not only in comparison with this um, young Marx, that is, once again, a Marx that I adore, I did my PhD dissertation, but you know, we cannot use that to understand Marx's uh, main ideas and analysis of capitalism, and also is philosophical ideas, if you want, okay? And uh, um, I would say that it is also ignored compared to many other parts of, this, of his life. So if you look at the, the intellectual biographies of Marx, and unfortunately there is a separation between theoretical works and biographies, that is something that I always try to avoid for the reason that I mentioned before, because you must know what Marx is doing, why he went to that document, why he left incomplete that text, if you really want to understand what kind of weight, what kind of value you should give to this. But uh, these uh, um, uh, academic writings usually ignore the intellectual biography of Marx and intellectual biographies usually are very superficial and don't, don't go in depth, right? One example of this is the most famous biography of Marx, one that was written by Franz Mehring in 1918. And, you know, Mehring could not write the chapter on capital and he asked Rosa Luxemburg to write that on his behalf. So this uh, ignoring the last decade of Marx is unfortunately something that is not only um, a characteristic of uh, studies and biographies until the 70s, the 80s, but it's something that we can also see now. So there were many publications in the past years. Of course, many of them were written around Marx bicentenary. And, uh, you know, the trend is um, always the same. Gareth Stedman Jones, Liedman, I can make many other examples, but many of them ignored and just wrote a few pages about what happened to Marx after the end of the international, after the, uh, the critique of the Gotha problem. Usually these pages are related to the very known polemic with um, Rosa Luxemburg, but this is a polemic that has a much bigger background in Marx's um, uh, deep analysis of uh, Russian society and also the political connection with them. So, um, I've been working on this, and when we talk about rethinking alternative with Marx, I think that the last years of Marx should play a bigger role. Of course, I want to uh, prevent students because these documents are very difficult to read sometimes. So we are reading manuscript with a very high level of complexity both textual and conceptual, because, you know, sometimes Marx is mixing all these languages, is writing one sentence in Greek, one sentence in Russia. So that's why we need editors doing this work for a, for a wider audience. And also in terms of, you know, conceptualization of some of the, um, you know, um, doubts, problems, um, open questions that he had. But in this period, in these documents, by using them, by reading them, by balancing the reading of Marx a little bit more with the international and with the last decade, I believe that we will do justice to the interpretation of this author, because as I said before, we can, um, you know, really delete some of the worst representation of Marx, many of them in connection with Marxist-Leninism of the 20th century. So, a dogmatic Marx, an economicistic Marx, an Eurocentric Marx, a, a notor fixated only with the conflict between class within um, capital and, and labor. But also we can go to issues that are of crucial importance for our times and that have been ignored for, for many decades. Some of them are, uh, you know, ecology, gender emancipation, um, critique of nationalism, you know, uh, the collective ownership uh, of means of production, uh, ownership not controlled by the state. And, you know, I mentioned migration before, individual freedom, that is a very important topic. 
sometimes we, I believe that some of the interpretation about these documents exaggerate a little bit. And I'm against this idea that every time there is a new page, a new document published in the mega, there is this idea that we are reading a new Marx and all the people who read Marx before, they, they didn't understand anything, right? And you know, people who are 65 years old, they read Marx for 40 years. Now there is this new document, this is changing everything, right? So I'm completely against this. At the same time, I have to say that sometimes I read some um, interpretation about ecology, very important in Marx, gender emancipation, you know, a little bit less important for Marx, but still there are, you know, significant pages about this and there are, you know, good uh, work that have been published in the past year. Heather Brown is uh, one of them. Also, she wrote the chapter in the Marx Survival. But I don't think that we should exaggerate like that Marx um, was right all the time. And it is also useful to take some of these documents to see, you know, a door that Marx opened and not only Marx, right? Because if we want to read ecology today and we want to use, you know, the, as I said before, the giants of the past, then it's nice also to read Charles Fourier, to read uh, Kropotkin and to read many other authors that uh, more than Marx, perhaps, um, had uh, significant ideas about this. So Marx left many um, uh, problems unsolved, um, unsolved theoretical problems in relation to capital. Um, as I mentioned before, there are reasons for this incompleteness. Usually I mentioned the misery, health, but also the rigor of Marx and the scale of this project that was becoming bigger, bigger and bigger and therefore more complicated even to conceive for a single scholar who was no longer in the most brilliant phase of his life, like for example at the time of the Grundrisse. But the interesting things for me are the new research horizon that were opened by Marx at the time. Because Marx is, you know, without any question expanding on a global scale is research paying much more attention to the South spending a lot of time analyzing uh, pre-capitalist economies, Mexico, Algeria, India, and uh, also um, opening doors into new disciplines, like for example, anthropology, like Marx return to the uh, study of history. Um, you know, there is this big period at the end of the 50s and now at the end of the 70s, there is a lot that Marx has done. I can go in details later if you want ancient society, there is a lot of uh, um, work that Marx is doing because uh, perhaps he wanted to make research on the most likely sequence with which the different mode of production succeeded each other over time. And then there are these big questions that um, I mentioned one, for example, the one with uh, uh, Vera Zasulic, so the question about the obscena, the question about basically, you know, the um, role of capitalism that is very important for us and uh, uh, not by chance has been um, retaken and uh, um, debated uh, very seriously in, uh, in, in South America very uh, recently. Alvaro Garcia Linera, the former vice president of Bolivia, did a, a very interesting publication about all these writings about the rural commune in uh, Russia, a commune destined to perish or can be socialist skipping capitalist. That has been a very big topic of debate that I'm leaving to our conversation um, because I can already see that it's nine. So I just want to add um, a final word of conclusion. I don't think once again that Marx is changing his uh, main ideas in this period. Of course, he is expanding, is becoming more flexible, is uh, um, understanding not only as a scholar, that's important for me, Marx is understanding, is learning a lot from political experiences, from the Paris Commune, for the, 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 the uh, populist in, in Russia, right? That, you know, like Lenin said, you don't have to wait all the perfect circumstances to do the revolution. And in fact, Marx believed that this revolution, not the socialist revolution, but, you know, can start also somewhere else. And we know the ideas of Marx about uh, the British working class 
that are now part of this uh, imperial project. And there is a lot of skepticism about Marx and Engels that you know, the revolution will start there. But I want to say that Marx is not becoming a new Herzen. So Marx is not changing at the end of his life his ideas about capitalism, about the role of capitalism. And um, uh, the idea is that um, capitalism is not always a necessary transition. I would like to say this, if I had to say in a, in a, in a telegram, in a, in a few words. So not a sketch fatally imposed elsewhere, I think he wrote in uh, uh, a couple of letters, never sent or never published. And this made Marx different from the Marxist at the time, also the Marxist in Russian, who, Russia, who wrote that uh, capitalism was actually universally obligatory. So um, I am already beyond my time. And uh, I just want to say that um, Marx analysis must, of course, be updated. Marx is not able to respond to many of the issues that we have in our contemporary society. But, and we have to pay attention to all the other socialist ideas when we want to go back in this debate and not looking at Marx like the only star in the sky. And sometimes paying attention, you know, doing a bad interpretation also means to, you know, read Marx uh, more critically than in the past. But I believe the more I read this, uh, this century of socialism, the more I think that Marx is really the key for anti-capitalism, for having, you know, clear what is, um, what are the essential elements of uh, an anti-capitalist thought, a different kind of society. And even if Marx is not able to provide many times the answers, like in the past, I would say that Marx is very useful for us because he helped us to understand um, to ask, perhaps even better than understand, to ask the right questions, to identify the main contradiction. And this is not little in uh, times of crisis like the one that we are living today. Thank you. Marcelo, yes, thank you very much for the, the buildings. Great question. Uh, you uh, dealt with so many issues. Uh, so not just uh, the topic and um, listening alternative. So, uh, you, yeah, you discussed uh, starting from the uh, revival of uh, Marx and uh, Marx studies in recent times and your own contributions to the revival of Marx. And also you talk about the teach Marx to read. And also uh, you talk about uh, so the publication history of uh, Marx's works, and you very so, succinctly so, popularized Marx's writings as uh, the, the self-published uh, works and the manuscripts, and also the uh, notes, notebooks and experts. And also you uh, discussed about the uh, reception of Marx after so, so Marx is the is a theorist and the activist is a master. And, uh, and the, in, you also is a emphasize uh, the uh, necessity of, of uh, a new reading of Marx uh, based on the recent publication of uh, Mega. So uh, especially we need to is a focus on the later writings of Marx. It's, you know, it's a late Marx and also the uh, political writings. And yeah, and you you really uh, uh, you talk about and you say, yeah, I fully uh, uh, agree and uh, with you, and I'm very uh, uh, pleased and uh, proud that uh, I'm also it's a part of your it's a enormous contributions to the recent uh, this, uh, revival of Marx. So, uh, so now, so rather than I uh, uh, discuss or comment your this um, very uh, good uh, uh, presentation, uh, I would rather be open the 
this uh, discussion to, to the floor first. So, so anybody who wants to ask questions or comment on Mark, uh, <laughs> Marcelo Suski, uh, please raise your hand and ask question or comment, or you can write your question or comment in, in, in um, Yeah, I think so, Jing, yeah, if you do not disagree, if you do not disagree, I think it's nice that we talk to each other. It's also one of the wonderful things of this uh, sessions that you organize, that we are not a very big uh, crowd. So there is a lot of time that we can spend in the discussion. So I see in the chat that uh, Kan Kangal have a few questions. So please, oh, that just yeah. um, instead of putting in the chat, I think it's nicer to to, to have it live and also some of the scholars we have been in touch for many times it's nice to see each other with the, with the, with the camera if it's possible and also you know um, I will be happy to try to, to reply but we can also have a collective discussion so I would like to take two three questions and then I will answer to all of them or comments or critical remarks so Kangal do you want to start? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Very oh, yeah. well. Nice to nice to hear you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, actually, I am curious about a few things, and these are really no um, discussion points. Uh, the these things that I am curious about in your work. Um, first, what is your favorite moment in Marx in terms of the uh, period of time? This would be uh, my first curiosity. And this is really not a discussion, discussion point. I'm asking just because I am curious. Uh, second, something completely irrelevant to the first question. Uh, and this is something specific, but I'm curious as to what, I'm curious what you think. On this 1844 manuscripts of Marx published in the first section of Mega, uh, do you believe that these manuscripts belong to the first section or the fourth section? That is, uh, whether it would have been a better idea to um, publish these manuscripts in the fourth section instead of the first one. Um, and if there is time, but you don't have to answer this, this third question, but I'm still curious. So it is really up to you, optional. Um, what, do you think the place of Ingas is in Marx's research? After all, this is another person, and we know the close connection between Marx and Ingas. And since I am doing Ingas research, I, I am just curious as to what your point of view is about this. Thank you. Thanks to you. Like I said before, Sanjin, do we want to take two, three um, questions, remarks, and, uh, and then I will try to answer? Oh, yes, uh, but I found the, uh, no other questions. So you may. Any other respond. comment? Let me see if there is uh, somebody else. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't find. So why don't you? Nobody else? Uh, not yet. So uh, why don't you <laughs> proceed to? So, <laughs> because I wanted to avoid this very complicated question of uh, Kan Kangal. No, it's a joke. First of all, it's a pleasure to see him in person after many exchanges. He published this uh, wonderful book on uh, Engels in the series Marx Engels Marxism, a book that has been very successful so far, uh, widely debated, reviewed, and um, I'm also following uh, his other publication, re not only on Engels, you know, recently the things of the very young Marx. So um, it's a pleasure to uh, discuss uh, with you, Can. Um, the first question is a, is a complicated question um, because, you know, I spent uh, really many, many years reading Marx. And uh, if you ask me what is the favorite Marx, you know, immediately I will ask you, counter ask you from, from which point of view. Um, because, you know, in some phases of his life, there is perhaps uh, a better Marx as, um, as an activist. 
and uh, um, as a scholar or also as a human being. So I don't want to enter into this um, complicated, this, you know, differentiation, etc. But um, I was uh, uh, impressed by the, the power of Marx in 1857-58 uh, to write this uh, manuscript from himself, the Grundrisse. That is also one of my favorite texts, of course, I have nothing to do with those people who say that the Grundris is better than Capital, et cetera, not at all. But it's a wonderful text for me because Marx is um, writing against capitalism. And at the same time, sometimes it really seems that he cannot stop his, uh, his pen, his writing. And then there are all these wonderful um, ideas um, about the most important topics for me that are individual freedom, um, liberties, um, uh, communist society, um, use of technologies. So if you know what are the limits of the Grundrisse from many points of view, but you um, go back in this um, complicated biography of Marx, because as I said, the Grundrisse is just a, an eruption of hope that the revolution is finally arriving in Europe after a decade of counter-revolution. And uh, he was also at the core of his uh, productivity, I would say. The publication of Capital of volume one is uh, um, a very um, slow agony because for 10 years, Marx is uh, really struggling against the severe um, health um, issues. And, uh, and publishing this book is, uh, is, uh, is very complicated for him. Um, the, the last Marx is another uh, very interesting moment for me um, because it's, it's also the most intimate Marx, right? And I like this very much. So reading those letters and uh, looking at uh, Marx's weaknesses and looking at the response that he had, that is from my point of view, um, the possibility of um, becoming, I don't want to abuse these things because we have been, there, there have been abuse of this, but I was, I was going to say becoming a Marxist. I would say like, you know, becoming a dogmatic thinker, like, you know, I've written about this, I've done it, you know, I'm just restating my positions and I'm avoiding the issues. So everything that I've read about this Marx, you know, the last years of his life is actually going into another direction. And it's a wonderful message for me as a, as a modest scholar, as, as an activist, like the idea of leaving this door open, like uh, staying in the contradiction, expanding the, 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 the research, being curious about uh, other aspects uh, of, of, uh, of life. And so this is um, um, wonderful uh, too, and surely one of my favorite marks to, to go back to your, um, to your question. Then there is also this, uh, um, you know, Marx of the International that, you know, is um, very important for us because once again, the men uh, understand that uh, he must compromise and give up a significant part of his uh, uh, scholarship in 1864. He has not published the first volume of Capital and he has to focus on this, uh, you know, possibility of having, you know, a significant political organization, not significant as we thought for many decades, because the international was, you know, a small organization that had barely the money to pay the rent of one room in, in London, right, where the general council used to meet once a week. But is much more than um, all the um, programs in, uh, in the books. And of course, Marx is not an anti-intellectual. The 1844 is a, a text that uh, will belong much more to the fourth section than to the first. You know, I understand your provocation. And actually, I come from that kind of trajectory because, as I said, I did my PhD on this um, on this text, but it would have been perhaps impossible to bring them 
uh, outside the, the, the first section, because as I said, this is one of the most sold and read uh, <laughs> classics, you know, of, of Marx uh, and then Marxism. So uh, it is uh, surely interesting to, if I have to go into, you know, very specific things that perhaps only few of us will understand, to see, you know, why these comments on James Mill have been taken out and they are published in, the, in somewhere else, and on the contrary, the, 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 the three manuscripts of the 1844 are published in the first section. But we understand why, because the text was already a book. You know, the German ideology could be a similar um, discourse, and actually some parts are even more, more complicated. Um, the last question is perhaps, uh, you know, even more difficult to respond than, than the first one, because we have to open this very, you know, complicated and um, long debate about the Marx-Engels relationship. I made a comment in my presentation about this, and I said that in some parts of their life, there were um, level of cooperations of collaboration that were significant when Marx and Engels are writing and living together between, uh, um, you know, the end of the period of Paris and then uh, Brussels and uh, this um, work with um, journalism, not only the New York Tribune, but also the, the encyclopedia with Charles Dana, et cetera. So there is a, a lot of exchange and, you know, it goes without saying that Engels is extremely important for Marx in every time Marx has a question. Even when Marx is doing something fun, and he says, oh, I've invented something. I think I got something interesting. He wants to see what Engels thinks about this. But, um, you know, uh, the state of, 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 uh, of capital, um, this um, uh, complicated research of the last phase of his life, you know, is something that even though Engels lived in London at the time and left Manchester, is something that, uh, you know, mostly belonged to Marx because, you know, Engels lost also the, 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 the hope that Marx could publish, you know, volume two of Capital. You know, there are these wonderful letters. One of my favorite volumes, actually, if I can say this to, to is this um, uh, edited volumes of uh, Anses Berger's with all these um, correspondence and stories about uh, um, uh, people who were in touch and who met Marx and Engels in their lives. And there is this wonderful story that Marx is uh, receiving this document from uh, Maxim Kowalewski that became uh, one of his uh, best scientific friends. This statistic in Russia, every time Kowalewski is coming to, to their house, to Marx's house on Sunday, because it is the day that the house was open to comrades, friends, to have a lunch and sometimes walk in Amsterdam. Eat. And you know, Engels and Jenny, Jenny von Westphalen, Marx's life, my wife, they said, you know, don't bring more documents here. We want to burn these things because otherwise Marx is keep reading, 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 and then he will never finish the things that he promised to do. So uh, having said that, you know, Engels has done what uh, he could, but you know, I don't want to open here with many, many problems. Like, you know, for example, recently I read the paper of uh, uh, Zaremka who presented here a few, um, uh, weeks ago, but of course, our view today, the view of uh, philologists, of you know, scholars of the 2021, is much different than than you know, Engels' uh, political responsibilities at the time. In any case, a very wonderful friendship and intellectual relationship, one of the most interesting of the 19th century that lasts for 40 years. Marcelo, well, thank you very much for four years. So thank you. It's kind responses to Kim Kinga. So any other questions, please? Oh, Peter, yes. I see Peter. Peter yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcel. That was a fascinating uh, survey that you gave us. And thank you all for this series as a whole. Uh, one thing that's been um, a tendency in some Marx scholarship for the past decade or more is this distinction that some scholars make between the esoteric Marx 
namely his theory of value and his tracing of the abstract logic of capital versus supposedly the exoteric Marx, that is the political writings, the um, uh, writings on non-Western uh, society, uh, as an argument being that the esoteric writings, that strict theory of value, is where we find uh, the core of Marx, and these more exoteric political writings, for instance, um, are, are at, at the very least secondary or even contrary to the theoretical um, essence that we should be drawing from his work. Now, I have a sense, of course, from your own work that this is a distinction you don't accept. <laughs> um, and I think it's a problematical distinction myself. So I'd like to hear more, though, about how you respond to that claim of this distinction. You hear it in Moshe Pistone and Salviapi, many value form theorists uh, build their work upon this distinction where they focus on um, a dimension of Marxist capital, the theory of value, which is, of course, very central. Uh, but they make no effort to try to ask what's the internal coherence of Marx's entire project uh, as, as a whole. And so I'm interested to hear what's your view of this and how, what's, uh, what kind of tools of criticism can you give us in responding to it? Thank you, Peter. Like before, Sun Jing, if there are other questions, in particularly now, so can kind of give me three so that I can combine later. Oh, Com oh critical okay. remarks. See, you can listen to articles. No. Yeah. Marcelo. No, nobody else? Um, I see there are two messages in the chat. Oh, it's just Peter and, and Khan. So nobody else? Good. So as uh, Peter knows, I am actually very close to his um, interpretation readings of not only of Marx on socialism. And sometimes when I have to go to this uh, polemic, I uh, enjoy his writings and I use them. <laughs> and um, uh, we are, uh, um, um, I would say, um, very uh, uh, similar in um, giving relevance to this um, uh, political writings of Marx. Now, this question could be a question that, um, you know, um, um, you know, could be very long or very short, because in this um, the distinction between the esoteric and the exoteric Marx, uh, there are uh, many um, interpretations, many critiques, and we could go back to different writings of Marx. For example, um, one big polemic belong, and I made um, a mention uh, to this, to the Grundrisse versus Capital. So even before the polemic between, you know, capital and political writings, there is this um, uh, actually more than one tendencies in, uh, in Marxism, um, you know, the idea that actually Marx corrupted his uh, initial um, um, understanding and uh, representation of uh, the critique of capitalism and in this process of uh, making his uh, uh, magnum opus um, readable to workers, to the working class, actually Marx had to use many categories, many ideas that lost the core and uh, the Hegelian uh, dialectic of uh, the end of the 50s of the Grundrisse. I already you know, mentioned this before, and I said that I definitely do not share this. The distinction between the theory of capital and uh, you know, the political writing, the political activities, or even also the political interest of Marx, it seems to me a very fictitious distinction that actually is like you know, dividing once again, the, 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 the biography, the life, the intellectual interest of this person into, into two parts. Why? And I mentioned before that we cannot consider like Marx, like an isolated scholar who is only learning from the books that he's reading in, this, uh, in the British Museum. I really believe that Marx has learned a lot in his political activity and uh, in the exchange with the political uh, groups um, in these two decades, in the 60s and the 70s, uh, in particular, more than in the 40s. But in the 40s, Marx is a young, you know, it's 30 years old, right in 1948, 1849. He had a different um, kind of uh, 
uh, a position like um, editor of the uh, Neue Rheinische Zeitung. And um, uh, political writings, uh, political activity is also something that helps Marx to rethink or at least to pose himself question about uh, um, you know, the, the, the main uh, topics of, uh, of capital. As I mentioned before, I don't think that there is a, you know, a complete change like, um, uh, you know, sometimes I've been debating this with my very dear colleague, uh, Tomonaga Tairako. Uh, but, uh, you know, certainly this uh, um, uh, political, um, I would say more than writing Peter, I would say the political research, right, or, you know, um, these topics, these uh, things that Marx extended, this, the focus of his research to new disciplines, to new parts of the world, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is something that is also helping him to, to have um, a more uh, uh, flexible uh, approach, right, in the in the representation of capital. And you know, next year I'm preparing a book about the 150th anniversary of the French edition, and uh, we are uh, debating, discussing these things. One of the main contributions that we have in the volumes, one of the main topics that we have, is from Moscow to Paris, right? Because you know. Usually we look at this uh, analysis of uh, Capital Volume 1 only if there's an internal um, uh, analysis of the text, while there is a lot that is taken from um, uh, you know, um, political events of the time. Then Peter also mentioned this question of internal coherence. That is you know, also something a little bit complicated from this point of view to look in you know, um, the political um, attention that Marx is giving to some topics at the end of his life. Because as I said before, it is not always easy to understand why Marx did that and what was actually doing. For example, when with the last energies that he had, he wrote this um, 600 pages of notes about uh, history between uh, you know, one century before uh, uh, Christ and the, the, the 30 years war. So the, 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 the middle of the 17th century. Um, th there are also some problems and, uh, you know, Peter Rudis has written about this. Um, I will try to see if he can write a little bit more about this in the coming years. But there is this big complicated question about uh, the relationship with the Marx with this ancient society. Right, and sometimes there are some formulations that are a little bit weird, like uh, this question that um, you know, um, um, uh, borrowing this uh, wonderful expression from Chernyshevsky, that is another author that played a very big role in Marx, that should be the focus on more attention and uh, publications, conferences in the coming years. But this idea that the grandmother is usually nicer with the niece than the parents, and therefore the society of the future might look from a certain point of view uh, similar to the pre-capitalist society. This is something that, you know, here and there, there are a few sentences of Marx that are ambiguous from, from my point of view. And this is one of the regrets of my book, The Last Years of Karl Marx, because at some point, I wanted to write a bigger analysis of the anthropological notebooks, but the publisher wanted to have a compact book of 200 pages that was an intellectual biography that uh, a wider audience could read. And then in the end, I decided that this was the good idea. I don't regret this, but um, the ethnological, uh, the anthropological studies, etc., of Marx are still one of the most uh, complex um, um, uh, places where to try to understand this internal coherence. Because I'm not saying that Marx was not coherent, etc., but um, it is uh, um, sometimes still difficult for us to understand in which direction he wanted to go. In any case, like Peter Rudis, I think um, I will not support this kind of uh, division, and I don't find any basis, going back to Kahn Kangal, in Marx's biography, in, you know, in his letters, in his life, in his uh, um, um, 
um, activism that will support this, right? So I see it more like sometimes an um, academic exercise that is, you know, very useful sometimes, very good, but uh, not responding to 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 to, to Marx's wills. Oh. Well, thanks very much. There is, yeah, so quickly the so responses to Peter's question. Is there any other question? It looks like, then may I uh, raise a, a question? So uh, I think your uh, emphasis on the differentiation of uh, Marx's writings in importance is, uh, I think it's a very good point. So uh, I would like to apply your emphasis on the later writings of Karl Marx. So in my point of view, I think uh, the most important text of later Marx is the, uh, uh, as you know, I, I think you also agree, is the um, uh, draft letters or letters to Vera Jaslich. I think it's a uh, uh, final year's uh, Marx text letter, so letters to Vera Jaslich and the, the three drafts, they are very, very important. So, but we all know that, uh, we know that uh, that aspect of uh, Marx uh, was already it's, uh, not new. It has already been it's, uh, very it's, uh, deeply discussed almost uh, 30 years ago. As you know, uh, for example, the, the, the book is uh, uh, it's edited by Theodore Shanin. It's, uh, it's uh, late Marx. It's already in that book. So I think that was, the book was published in 1983, and also uh, during the debate on dependency, uh, dependency as all the uh, peripheral capitalism, also is the so-called the dependency debate in the late 1970s or the early 80s, the uh, writings of later Marx uh, is, uh, was, is, is, uh, <clears throat> uh, was very important. So, uh, so the, the, what do you think is the new findings or the new aspect of uh, later Marx is, uh, after the is, uh, mega? So, so, so do you think uh, is there any crucial aspect that has not been known to us? Uh, I don't, yes, it's uh, in the late Marx. And that's my first question. And, uh, my second question, uh, this question is also a similar question that I already uh, raised to Professor uh, Tomonaga Tairaku. Uh, uh, although you did not talk in uh, detail uh, concretely about the alternatives to so Marx ideas or alternatives to capitalism, post capitalism today, uh, but uh, you also, yeah. Uh, mentioned and discussed somewhat. So, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, in the text in uh, Vera Jaslici, uh, letters to Vera Jaslici, Marx's uh, idea of post capitalism could be, can be summarized as a return uh, to, uh, to the it's a, it's a, it's a community, it's a, or it's a, a revival of its archaic type of community is uh, on a higher level. Uh, that is, I think, the it's a Marx the new concept of post-capitalism. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, in, uh, late, in late, it's, uh, late Marx. But as you know, in the, in the, it's a mature Marx, mature Marx, you also uh, talk about the, uh, that's capital, but much of Marx, much of Marx's uh, concept of post capitalism is uh, is uh, is uh, association of free individuals for the uh, re-establishment 
of the individual property. So, uh, so do you think the Marx idea of post-capitalism uh, changed in, in his later years from his mature times? So that's my second question. Thank you, Sanjin. And it's also uh, 9.35. Is there anybody who would like to uh, make a comment or ask a question? Because I guess that you want to end after this. So if there is anybody else. Yeah, I don't find. OK. So um, uh, the. Oh, oh the... so uh, Tomorada, yeah, raised the question. So you can. Sorry. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. Please, your mic on. Okay. But, okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marcello and uh, Peter Hudis, Mr. Peter Hudis. Uh, I I'll just uh, mm, my own comment on what uh, so uh, 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 what is uh, what is discussed among uh, uh, two or three uh, uh, colleagues so once uh, uh, the significance of the uh, late late marks so my approach is not just reading what marx himself wrote Marx himself left. Uh, in my opinion, uh, in order to understand the Marx uh, changing idea or uh, the um, transformation of Marx, uh, we have no uh, uh, history, intellectual history of German political economy and German historical sciences. Marx himself is not an isolated intellectual island, but so Marx is deeply influenced by the uh, great paradigm changes uh, which place in on Germany, uh, especially in German political economy and uh, German historiography. So uh, therefore, uh, in, in order to interpret uh, the uh, draft for the letter to the Zurich, we have to regard the transformation of the paradigm of the German historiography. As Marx wrote Grundriss, so the main or the uh, predominant idea on uh, all the Germanic community was based upon Justus Meza. Justus Meza was a, a, a German historical of, uh, in the 18th century. He wrote the history of Osnabrück and other writings and uh, he firstly uh, 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 offered, offered, uh, uh, offered a very influential idea on Germanic community as uh, consisting of individual farmers. Therefore, uh, so-called uh, old German community is not uh, united society, uh, but consisted, uh, uh, composed of individual farmers. This idea, Marx himself accepted in the 70s, but, but in the 60s, uh, the another uh, interpretation became dominant in Germany. So uh, the, the, the turning point is, or the main figure, uh, uh, who brought about this uh, paradigm change was uh, oh 
this Rudolf Maurer. George Rudolf Maurer. Marx uh, encountered uh, Maurer uh, just after the publication of Capital One. But so he was very deeply convinced of the significance of what Maura brought about in the interpretation of all Germanic uh, community. And uh, so therefore, ten, more than 10 years before he uh, wrote uh, uh, the draft uh, for the letter to the Hasuriti, Marx had been intensively uh, reading Maura. Therefore, uh, um, the, surich, uh, the drafts uh, for the letter of the surich, uh, did not come from, simply come from the communication with Russian revolutionaries. But so based on the very uh, radical transformation of the historical ideas which took place in the German historical sciences. Therefore, uh, in, in this sense, uh, we have to interpret, interpret uh, the uh, draft for the letter to the Surit in the very broad perspective. Uh, in, the, uh, in terms of the German historical sciences. So this is one point. And the second point is what uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Hudis uh, so put, uh, put a question. So two uh, uh, seemingly contradictory um, core of Marx's theory. On the one hand, very String, uh, uh, very strict theoretical construction, uh, constru construction of economic idea, economic theory. On the other hand, uh, political, historical, and uh, uh, outer uh, European histories. So how to combine two seemingly contradictory elements? Uh, so how to unite? So. Uh, I have uh, no definite answer, but I suggest uh, one good direction. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Marx's economic uh, political economy doesn't uh, is uh, completely unfinished. It means so. This must be uh, uh, developed, further developed. And in the third volume of Capital, Marx uh, repeatedly emphasized uh, on so-called so mystification, the concealment of the core or the essence of the uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we uh, further develop the political um, Mm -hmm. political economy of Marx further the uh, what direction of uh, which Marx himself developed uh, in the direction of uh, reification, uh, mystification, and concealment of the essence. We uh, we can. Uh, go nearer to more phenom phenomenal historical uh, facts. Therefore, it is not uh, productive if we uh, uh, so contrast between uh, rather abstract theory uh, of uh, political economy and on the other hand, uh, political writings. Uh, in Monsieur Ranier, uh, in the journals, we have to more uh, con concretize the 
theory of uh, political economy. So I'm sorry that I cannot express my idea a uh, very explicit way, but uh, I think uh, you can understand what, uh, what I mean. Thank you very much. Of course, of course we can, Professor Tomonaga, and uh, we are all very grateful. By the way, I'm gonna do a little advertisement for the series Marx Engels Marxism because one of the next books in, under contract is uh, Professor Tomonaga's volumes and is actually um, putting together a brilliant uh, contributions on um, some of the topics that he mentioned. I um, completely agree with what he said and I hope that it was clear in my presentation that uh, this uh, curiosity that Marx had um, always in his life, even at the, end, at the very end when he was in a uh, you know, very bad um, health um, uh, conditions, this um, interest for the new disciplines, this, um, the fact that he always wanted to be updated, right? And uh, is actually very much connected with these uh, things that, uh, that were mentioned by, by you, by Tairaco, right? So that there is an impossibility to really understand the, the, the development of Marx, as you said, if you don't put them in the context of um, historiography, of political economy all this time. And we know that Marx used to read in many languages, debate in many things, and also of this new disciplines. And, you know, usually we didn't mention this, so that's why I, I say, but, you know, I think we should mention the famous classic ancient society of uh, Morgan. Um, that, by the way, was a book that was brought by, by Kovaleski, by his uh, Russian friend. I just want to say that it's um, always uh, fascinating reading the contribution of uh, Professor Tomonago Mauer. And uh, it's um, very good that he helped us to put the accent on this author. I just want to say that um, Chernyshevsky is also another author that is so relevant for Marx, so relevant. And that is also another author that Marx is discovering after the publication of Capital Volume 1. The encounter is in the early 70s. And Marx wanted to do so many things about him, including he wanted to write a little profile, which is something that Marx wrote about few other people in his correspondence, like the famous letter that Marx wanted to write, the Hegel Science of Logic in a way that could be understood by, by, by many people. So I found fascinating, and I think that we should move in the next years to you know, study more and to um, do uh, new work that are um, um, that is useful in order to understand these chains, right? That are much more complex, as uh, Tomonaga told us, than you know, just receiving a letter from Beret Zasulic and then writing this letter. Because actually, the political demand from Beret Zasulic is very connected with the intellectual work that Marx is doing. At the same time, this is a coincidence on anthropology, ethnography, et cetera, et cetera. So in connection with what Seon Jing said, really in one minute, it's time to, to, to end this uh, talk. And I'm very grateful to your attention and uh, contributions and um, ideas that will make me improve my research in the future. But these letters to the Zulich, like the letters that Marx wanted to write to the, um, you know, um, patriotic notes. Um, Vanessa who is here with us today. She will give us the perfect Russian pronunciation, but I mean the, the journal that um, published a review of Capital and one other letter not published, not sent by Marx because Marx didn't send the beautiful drafts of uh, the letters to Zasulic. He only sent one small letter with a little bit of cowardly, right? Because it was such a complicated thing that Mark said, as you know, I have such a strong headache, like I don't feel like going out tonight. But um, the crazy thing is that the letter was not published by, by Vera Zasulic and by Plekanov, and it came out. So that's a very interesting story that I want to write about the reception of, uh, of the, 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 this debate, in particular, the letter to Vera Zasulic. And uh, Seon Jing was right. There is a very um, um, consistent debate. He mentioned Sharin, he mentioned the um, debate in South America and Latin America about dependency theory. But 
My opinion is the following. I believe that to the two questions of Seon Jin, you know, very brutally. Number one, the mega and the studies on the late marks are not providing any dramatic discovery in the future, like the one that we had in the table that I show you, like volume two and volume three, like the manuscript of 1844, or like the Grundrisse. And the most important things of Marx are there. There some corrections. There will not be dramatic discoveries. These corrections are very important. And exactly like um, Professor Tomonaga told us, you know, all the work that they have done with the recent volume of the, of the, of the, of the Mega with Koei Saito, with the Tim Grassman and many others, it's very useful because it helps specialists to better understand, even though then we have the responsibility to translate this Marxian hierography into a book that of 200 pages that can be served in the universities or can be useful for uh, you know activists and substitute the division of labor of the German ideology or at least implement the communist manifesto so that we have a better and more ample perception of Marx. So corrections, yes, important of course, but not dramatic discoveries. And this idea of return to the archaic community, it is in my opinion, uh, a statement that I see somewhere that is at least problematic, at least problematic. So one thing is the flexibility of Marx of looking at the history in a different way, not the preface of 1859. One thing is the very important change that is doing like looking at non-classical forms of organization of labor movement for revolution, for changes, you know, basically, you know, what Lawrence Crowder wrote many years, because you know this publication of the anthropological notebooks is perhaps the last big chunk of you know Marx materials that came out from the NACLAS, from the uh, unpublished uh, um, documents, right? So this debate, I wanted to mention Crowder because this contribution is important, and also if you read Kevin Anderson, you know that there is a strong connection with that scholarship that is, you know, three decades um, older than this. But I think that some of these formulations are, um, you know, problematic. Like Marx is not, is never, in my opinion, uh, underestimating the role played by capitalism, which does not mean that capitalism played a positive role that India should have been destroyed, the letter of 1853, the New York Tribune article, et cetera, et cetera. Marx is very clear in this, no, in this letter to Vera Zasulic, in this notes and comments that is making to the racist anthropologist of the time. But the idea that the post-capitalist of Marx is changing and is now something that is similar to an archaic community, I would say no, Sion Jing, like I mentioned before, Marx is not turning himself into a Bakunian, into Herzen at the time, into this Slavic, uh, pan-Slavic ideas that were, you know, something that he and Engels fought for the rest of his life. Then there is this, uh, interesting period, the Khan Kangals will might help us contributing on this topic in the future, in the decade, in the 12 years that Engels survived to Marx. In this debate that Engels had with Russian, with populists, you know, sometimes Engels was really being very aggressive against their interpretation, but, you know, this is another uh, topic that would brought us to Lenin, to the, to the NEP, uh, and et cetera and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, topic for other talks, uh, for other series organized by Sion Jing, by Jing Wu Bo, and uh, to them, once again, my gratitude, and if I may, also the gratitude of the speakers of uh, Kangal, Tamonaga, Udis, Zaremka, and, you know, all the other professors that perhaps are here online, and uh, those who were with us in the past months. So thank you. I think that we highlighted many uh, interesting points. And I think that we can agree on the fact that the, the Marx scholarship is um, alive today, that is playing once again an important role. And then we go back in the university um, without uh, letting the um, mainstream theories misrepresenting Marx like uh, 
a silly person who only understood the conflict between capital and labor, which are, of course, political reading that needs to, you know, put anti-capitalism in a corner. And, you know, North America is the, the perfect example for how these readings are on fashion today. And, you know, we can also conclude that uh, there is need for a new generation of, of, of working on these topics. And if I may, once again, I want to insist on this, not reading only Marx, but, you know, readings this 19th century in the way that Professor Tomonaga told us that is essential to understand and also take ideas, brilliant ideas, wonderful ideas of other socialists before and after Marx that were, you know, very uh, good at the time, but they lost the ideological battles. They were, you know, forgotten for a long time. And it is also our task today to rediscover them and to use them in order to, you know, have some light and some help in the reconstruction of anti-capitalist perspective for the 21st century. Thank you, everybody. And I'll give to Seon Jing the word for the final words. Marcelo, yes, thank you very much for the really wonderful talk and the discussion. I am also thankful for uh, Ken Kengar and Peter Hedis and Tomonaga Tairaku for excellent comments and questions, and all of you for attending Marcelo's talk. Uh, now is time to close the talk. As an organizer of this talk program, I am very pleased to conclude this talk program with Marcelo's excellent speech. Uh, based on the, I think, uh, it's the modest achievement of the previous two rounds of uh, Social Science Korea Global Marketing Online Talk, since last year, with total of 33 speakers on 33 topics, we are now preparing new round of uh, Global Marketing Online Talk, focusing uh, in in this uh, whole semester. So we look forward to all of you continuing participation and seeing all of you in the fall. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Sunjing. Thanks, everybody. So it's like a soap opera. I will never end. Yes. No. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. I send the. Uh...